who of you here had the Commodore 64? Uh, uh, Nintendo? Huh? Uh, Sega? Cool. Um, what else do we have? A Dreamcast. No, I didn't sell a lot of those, that's true. Uh, and uh, Nintendo 64? Yeah, GoldenEye? Okay, cool. So, um, we're still waiting for the movie, but uh, our next speaker, what? Uh, it's, uh, I don't know what it is, so we can all look <laughs> just to understand what it is. But I think <laughs> it's the intro movie to his talk. It's saying that everybody should come to this stage, yeah, and listen uh, to your talk. Yeah, f for me it's fine to begin. Uh, okay, you want. so yeah. let's go and uh, explain um, explain the, t w the the main concept of the talk. So our next speaker is a game fanatic. He had a Commodore 64. He loved games, and um, he's currently doing something with games. So imagine this whole hall. Imagine there's an emergency. Uh, I think you could accurately predict how the people will navigate through all the different doorways. And um, uh, one of the recent things you, you've done is simulate what is the best way of organizing the Grand Depart uh, and what would be the smart way where to put the fences. And this is where he is combining advanced mathematics with game technology in, uh, in order to understand how the crowd moves, and what is the smartest way to organize it. Now, please give a very loud applause for our next speaker, Dr. Roland Gerards. <laughs> Thank you for your uh, introduction, uh, Josef. Um, I'm uh, Roland Gerards, and I'm doing research in crowd simulation. And in uh, this uh, presentation, um, I'll explain how you can simulate crowds, what the mathematics is behind, but I also show many applications that are derived uh, from it. So who am I? Well, um, as uh, he said, well, I love computer games, so when I was nine I bought a, a Commodore 64. Uh, I played, I started playing games, and uh, when I was ten I started programming them because I really wanted to know how it all worked. So uh, when I was in high school, I uh, continued uh, playing games and also programming them. Uh, but, uh, and we created a clone of uh, Command and Conquer, which is a well-known game. Uh, however, there was one thing we really didn't get right, and that was uh, given a start position of a c uh, character that walks around, a goal position, try to connect it uh, um, such that it can walk from A to B. Well, I didn't get it right because it collided with obstacles, and uh, well, that was difficult. And ironically enough, that would become uh, the main topic of my uh, research. So, um, why would you need to simulate crowds? Well, uh, the reason is that it is very impractical uh, to uh, real life, do real life exercises with humans, say with more than 500 people. And the reason is that it has a big impact on the environment, it is very costly to organize, and you only can study a few scenarios. So that's why we have to do simulations. Well, we see that in uh, current society, simulations are being used more and more. Uh, for instance, uh, in uh, the train station uh, here in Utrecht, it is being uh, refactored for, well, for uh, many years. And uh, the NS, and the, so the Dutch railway, uh, wanted to know uh, whether people can still uh, catch their next uh, train. Uh, and in order to find that out, they performed simulations using our software. Uh, another example are um, big events like uh, the Love Parade. Uh, well, as you uh, might know, a few years ago it was organized the last time. And uh, because many people uh, came together, uh, there were lots of people uh, well, per square meter, like seven or eight uh, people per square meter. And if you have such a high crowd density, then uh, crowd pressures emerge from the crowd. And as a result, people simply get crushed to death. So uh, that is very um, dangerous. Uh, maybe you also remember uh, in this, uh, September uh, last year, uh, there was this pilgrimage in uh, Mecca, and there were also big streams of people that uh, came together, and uh, it was way too crowded, and as a result, uh, well, many people died. 
Um, so you can do uh, simulations of crowds to be better prepared for such events. So what you do is you try to find places where it will become too crowded, for instance. Uh, another branch of simulation um, is concerned with uh, doing evacuation studies in sports uh, stadiums. So um, a while ago, uh, a company that used our software based on our research, um, they did uh, simulations uh, for a, a soccer stadium in Brazil uh, for the uh, World uh, 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 Soccer Championship. And uh, it was a, a stadium that has a, had a capacity of 80,000 people. And by doing simulations, it turned out that only 50,000 people could be evacuated in, say, 15 minutes. And as a consequence, uh, 30,000 tickets couldn't be sold. And that's a big, uh, well, loss. Uh, however, if you, have, uh, if you had seen this on television, um, you would not have seen this. Uh, of spotted this, that uh, the stadium was empty because they used computer graphics uh, techniques to fill up the crowd. Well, they have so much money, apparently. So we see that uh, simulations are being used more and more. And um, so I also uh, work for um, computer science uh, department here in uh, Utrecht. And uh, one of our master programs uh, concerns with uh, game and media technology. So we also study uh, uh, crowds in games to uh, make uh, more believable uh, experiences. Okay, so simulation is used more and more. And the question is, yeah, well, how can you simulate a crowd? So uh, this is my mission. It's uh, a bit long sentence, lots of difficult world, words, and I'm going to explain it. So let me first read it. Well, my challenge is to unify dispersed models for realistic individual, small group, and collective human movements in interactive heterogeneous environments. So what does that mean? Well, if you look at crowd simulation models, you typically have two kinds of models. So at uh, the one hand, you have agent-based models. Uh, they focus at simulating individual people, pedestrians, for instance. Um, they are very good at that, so you can uh, create group uh, uh, behaviors, for instance, you can uh, all set all kinds of uh, parameters when you simulate individual agents. Uh, it works quite well, however, when the crowd density becomes really high, then those methods typically fail. On the other hand, uh, we have flow-based models. They work very well when it's very uh, dense in the crowd. So, for instance, if you want to uh, simulate uh, two big armies that have to approach each other and fight, well, those flow-based models are very good at that. But there is no individual behavior. And uh, what we want to do is to create one model uh, that can do handle both uh, crowds with individual behavior, but also flow-based behavior. And uh, I'll explain how to do that. Uh, next, we are um, uh, aiming at creating realistic movements. Um, so when it is becoming more and more dense in the crowd, so more packed, um, you want uh, people to uh, go with the flow. So that is important to create. Also, the movement should be uh, smooth and energy efficient because that's what people typically tend to do. Uh, you have to deal with uh, avoiding collisions in a natural way. You have to deal with uh, unrealistic congestions, etc. Um, also, this environment is not static because everything you know, might uh, change. So if a bridge uh, uh, bl is blown up, then, well, you want people to react on those changes. Or if you uh, place fences in the environment, then people should react on them. Um, by heterogeneous environments, I mean, um, so those are environments where you have a lot of information. So, for instance, um, bicycles, they behave differently on... Uh, this on uh, uh, the street uh, than on maybe a piece of grass. So you have to take all these factors into account to create realistic simulations. The question is, are we there yet? So uh, let's look at some uh, maybe old uh, games. Well, this is Command and Conquer. Uh, there is a group of people uh, that are moving and uh, the algorithm decides that one person uh, takes this side and it is being shot by this character. And it is quite frustrating for the player. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, so here the problem is groups split up. Here is another game. Uh, there is a character, uh, a non-player character, that has uh, get gotten stuck here. So it becomes a very easy target. And the reason is that the underlying representation that is uh, used for movements is uh, wrong. Uh, here is another game. Uh, there is a flying creature. 
and it is not able to fly over this ridge. And again, this representation that is used to represent uh, motions in the environment is wrong. Um, here is an, an example, World of Warcraft. Uh, there are some dynamic obstacles and uh, non-player characters just go through. And dealing with those uh, dynamic obstacles, or obstacles that just appear somewhere, is very complicated. And still, also modern games have difficulties with these. Uh, here uh, is a game, you are being attacked by uh, this monster, so uh, you step uh, some uh, here, and uh, the monster wants to attack you, you do a few uh, steps back, and again the monster decides to take a very long detour to again attack you. And here the problem is that, uh, well, they don't know how to deal with different types of surfaces. Here are some uh, car games, if you park it uh, near some, um, some entrances, some narrow passages, then you block them and characters just don't know how to handle these. And again, it's a difficult problem. And here is the same uh, uh, behavior, it's really stupid. Well, still, lots of gamers, uh, well, accept this because this is the way it is, but well, we have to approve that. So uh, let's, let's improve that. Um, so there are uh, many reasons uh, why these things go wrong, and I already mentioned one is that the underlying representation of the environment is wrong. Uh, local methods, they only look in the neighborhood, they don't consider global solutions, which you sometimes have to consider. Uh, groups split up because they haven't been planned as a coherent entity. Um, paths are unnatural, they are not smooth, they make like uh, 45 or 90 degree angles. Um, and, and the general conclusion is that the methodology that is used in the gaming industry um, is not general enough to solve all of these issues. So now we are, and here is a kind of an analysis why this is the case. So uh, lots of uh, uh, solutions that have been proposed, they stem from the area of AI and robotics. And um, uh, well, they can be used to uh, create motions for a single character, but when you want to simulate a crowd, it goes wrong. And the reason is that the underlying representations that are used to create those paths or motions, they are based on graphs. It, it's comparable with TomTom. Um, uh, -tom. uh, they have a uh, uh, network of motions, network of, of roads, which are connected. Um, and, um, and here is an example of uh, such a network. It's a grid that has been overlaid on top of the environment. And when you want to find a path from A to B, for instance, from here to here, uh, an algorithm finds the shortest path in this graph. Well, that works for one single character, but it's not going to work for crowds. Uh, we have to move to a representation that doesn't work with lines, with a network, but we have to move to a representation that reasons with surfaces. And I'm going to explain why this is going to solve it. Well, so um, the reason is that it doesn't work is that if you work with a graph or a network, then you don't have enough freedom to move, step away from the graph, from the edges of the graph. Uh, for instance, it's hard to avoid collisions between humans. So for instance, if you have a line here and uh, two people have to switch uh, positions, well, then how do they uh, deal with collisions here? Well, you don't have this information. It's also hard to deal with uh, entities with characters that have different sizes. So it's hard to deal with uh, soldiers versus tanks versus big groups because you don't have the information. It's also costly to deal with changes in the environment. Uh, it's hard to deal with uh, um, extra information you have of the environment. And also human navigation is surface based and later I will explain why this is the case. So we need to have a fast and generic framework. It looks like this. We have been uh, doing research together with uh, lots of people uh, to well, creating such a framework. Um, so first, we really have to think about how are we going to represent all walkable spaces in the environment, such that a computer can reason with it and uh, create simulations of big crowds. Um, well, given such a representation, uh, we create those motions for all of those uh, non-player characters or for humans or uh, bicycles, cars. Uh, by uh, having a, a framework that consists of five levels. On the top level, we consider all kinds of AI actions like, uh, well, I'm now standing here, I want to go to Amsterdam. What kind of actions do I need to perform? Well, first I have to get out of this Jaarbeurs, uh, then uh, I have to uh, walk to 
uh, a bus stop maybe, ta take a train, etc. Those are all uh, actions I need to perform to reach my goal. Well, from each of those actions, uh, we know a start location and an end location. Well, in uh, phase four, level four, we try to connect the start with the goal, um, and we refer to this as an indicative route. So a route which you try to take, uh, but you can still deviate from it. Um, in level three, so we traverse this indicative route, uh, which uh, and so and as a result, you know the locally the direction in which you can walk. Uh, however, when you have crowds, lots of uh, things can happen. So, for instance, you want to avoid uh, uh, having collisions with people, you want to uh, install uh, or have uh, group motions, you, you want to go with the flow, etc. And all of these adaptations of the routes happen in this level. And at uh, the lowest level, uh, we drive the animation system which makes the characters, well, animate. So, let's uh, discuss uh, these uh, steps a bit. Uh, first, I will uh, talk about representations, and uh, then I'll talk about path planning, and then about crowd simulation. And uh, more and more, you will see all kinds of uh, videos, so it, it's, it will get uh, funny, I think. Um, so when you are thinking about the representation of the environment, uh, well, you have to think of all kinds of criteria, like uh, if a path in the real world exists, then the computer should be able to also find such a path internally. Uh, then um, all the spaces that are covered, that are uh, walkable in the real world, should also be walkable in the virtual world. Um, uh, it should be relatively fast uh, to compute, it should be small to store, especially on, on uh, well, some, um, uh, mobile phones, for instance. Uh, and it should be fast to query, because you want to do simulation of crowds um, when you only have like 15% of CPU power available. So it really needs to be fast. So, uh, well, I'm a scientist, so I try all kinds of uh, approaches. Well, they all failed, so I uh, have thrown away a few years here. Uh, first, I looked at uh, some uh, mathematical uh, operations where you kind of uh, um, grow a fire that is being spread, and uh, that ends up with uh, areas in the environment which are very far away from obstacles. Well, that's an approach. Um, here I use sampling techniques where I just create some random points and I make sure that they have lots of distance to obstacles and I try to connect it. Uh, here I have a similar thing and I put uh, biggest disks on all these sample points. Well, it, uh, it is roughly right, but it, was, uh, well, it actually was not the best solution. So um, now we are going to discuss a solution that really works. Um, uh, like uh, six, uh, seven years ago, I had a colleague uh, at the university who was my uh, roommate. And at a certain moment, he uh, went on holidays for uh, three weeks. And he uh, really l uh, liked coffee. So, um, well, this was a coffee cup, and it was still, uh, well, there was uh, some coffee left. And uh, what happened? Well, at uh, certain places, uh, some uh, bacteria cultures uh, started to grow. And this, um, well, thing I saw really inspired me for the technique uh, we are now using and also the industry is uh, now using. So what happens is all these bacteria, they, uh, well, they start eating and uh, di digesting uh, well, all kinds of material here. And uh, at certain uh, um, moments in time, they, uh, uh, they find each other, so they uh, become neighbors. And when they become neighbors, a uh, graph structure uh, appears, like uh, all these edges here. So we can also do that in uh, computer science or in mathematics. Uh, our input is uh, a set of uh, obstacles which you want to uh, avoid, which are those uh, red points. And uh, we can create a, a, a graph structure um, which looks like this. And it has some nice properties like uh, all the points in such a cell are closest to a certain uh, obstacle point. And all these uh, blue line segments are farthest away from all those uh, obstacles. Well, that's uh, already nice to have. But it is not uh, enough, because uh, when you uh, create games, um, you have uh, footprints of obstacles, uh, which are typical polygons, and even you can have 3D situations. But uh, you can create uh, the same li structure for these kinds of obstacles, so that's good. But we are not there yet, because again we have a graph-based representation, so a set of uh, curves which you can traverse, but that's not going to work. So we need to go a step further. So uh, at the university where I'm walking, there are lots of bus stops. And um, 
uh, there are certain tiles near those bus stops, and they have inspired me to do the next step. So uh, what we do is uh, we have an obstacle here, and we have also obstacle borders here, and we can uh, draw line segments from obstacles to closest points on the boundary. Well, uh, we have this representation, and to uh, certain points uh, we can uh, uh, create connections to uh, closest points on boundaries. And this gives us a way to subdivide the walkable environment into uh, polygons or uh, areas. Those areas don't overlap, that's good, and it has all kinds of nice properties. Um, so uh, if you have a big environment, like a city environment, you can create uh, such a representation quite quickly. So that's good. It also works on a city level. Um, but uh, yeah, many games, well, they appear in 3D, so well, we have to go to, to 3D, right? And not only work in the plane. So um, the question is, how would you do this? Uh, this structure, which is uh, called a Voronoi diagram, well, you, can, you could try to compute it uh, for 3D environments, but this is not doable. Uh, people cannot do that. It's too complicated. Uh, there is one paper that can create such a figure for three line segments that uh, appear somewhere in space. And this is also not the structure you would uh, like to have because people are not walking mid-air. They are s stuck to the ground. Um, so instead, we have been working on uh, this uh, structure I just explained, uh, but it is now extended over surfaces. So uh, we can create uh, this uh, structure uh, to represent walkable spaces in train stations, airports, uh, etc. The question is, uh, how would you do this? Well, um, so uh, our input um, is an environment. It can be created by a game artist, a level designer, maybe by an architect. And we take this as an input, and uh, we are going to process it so, such that in the end we know where we can walk. Well, so what do we do? Uh, first, we remove um, polygons that are too steep, where you cannot walk on. Well, th then you have this. Uh, then we remove small regions where you cannot walk. Uh, the next step is to uh, remove the places in the environment where you cannot uh, walk under, because there is a roof, so well, you, uh, you can cut these uh, parts out of the environment. Uh, then you can simplify it a little bit, such that the uh, computations are faster. And then you can separate an environment into uh, sets of uh, layers. And all layer is two-dimensional, so we can again all apply all the well, standards, methods, and algorithms to each of those layers. Um, but then the question is, well, how do are you going to subdivide an environment into layers? Well, that's a very difficult uh, question, and uh, we have proven that uh, no simple solution exists. Um, I'm going to s uh, skip this. Um, so, what you can you do with it? Well, you can represent train stations, maybe libraries, or even uh, environments on a city level. Uh, it's very fast to compute, so uh, for a big uh, soccer stadium, it, it, it takes like three seconds to compute. So, it is all automatic, very fast. Um, this structure has many nice uh, properties. And uh, one of the nicest properties that things you define that work in 2D, like computing what you can see in an environment, computing a shortest path, computing a shortest path that has some clearance to obstacles, they all work in those multi-late environments, which is good. Um, what you also can do is uh, locally update this uh, representation if an uh, obstacle is inserted. For instance, when a bridge is, uh, uh, collapses, well, you can update this uh, uh, environment. And uh, while well we are giving a demo right uh, there at the Utrecht uh, area, where we can uh, place uh, those blocks interactively and the environment, uh, the rep underlying representation, and also the crowd reacts on those. Okay, so, um, well, are we there yet? Uh, well, still there is lots of uh, things to solve. Uh, there are lots of errors in, in, in games. We, we still see also in the more modern games. Um, well, here's a uh, StarCraft that uses a very modern uh, crowd simulation system, but also at a certain moment things go wrong because characters are not distributed optimally, etc. So, um, uh, I think now we are moving to a more interesting talk, uh, part of the talk, because now I'm going to show lots of movies that explain uh, well how you can uh, create crowds based on uh, a representation of the walkable environment. 
So at the highest level, we plan actions. So if something changes in the environment, people have to replan. Uh, for instance, here we have an obstacle. It is being inserted, and well, we have all kinds of behaviors. Uh, for instance, the green characters, they don't know that this obstacle is here, and once they see it, they replan their path. Well, these uh, um, red characters, they are like for, uh, Francis, so they know that something uh, is being uh, changed or has changed, and they immediately take a different route. And those uh, tiny uh, blue characters, well, they are small enough, so they still fit uh, through this uh, blockade. Uh, so this is done on the highest level. Uh, something different is, um, um, so we did an assignment for uh, the city of Amsterdam, uh, uh, for the north-south line, which is a, uh, a collection of metro stations. And uh, people wanted, wanted to find out whether th those metro stations could be evacuated in, say, 15 minutes. So we have to model uh, this problem. And one of the problems uh, we saw is that uh, all those people in the simulation took the same, uh, well, OV uh, uh, entrance here. And the reason is because they all take the shortest path. So, uh, well, you have to take, uh, change this behavior such that, well, all those characters, they, well, distribute themselves better. Well, this is also done on a high level. Uh, on a bit lower level, uh, we connect uh, start positions with goal positions. And what we have been doing for many years is that we have been computing a path, well, that connects the start with the goal, and then we just follow it. But that's not going to work for crowds uh, because it limits uh, the motions too much. And also humans don't do that either. So here is a kid, uh, there is a trail of raisins, and, well, he looks at a raisin, uh, walks to the raisin, picks it up, puts it in his mouth, and then, well, continuously uh, does that such that he ends up like here. And I also think this is a way uh, humans uh, will work. So if I want to get out of this uh, area, then I look at an exit and I start walking into that direction. And, uh, well, I think you do that iteratively. And, well, this process which uh, we try to mimic. So we have an indicative route which guides a person uh, towards a goal, and you can still you can pick points on this indicative route to watch you walk to, and then, well, finally you end up in the goal. Um, and around this indicative uh, uh, route, uh, we have a corridor that defines the local freedom, and this corridor can be extracted from this surface-based representation. Um, so uh, we can, uh, as an indicative route, you, you could ask yourself, how do you compute it? Well, we can uh, compute an indicative route, which is quite short, but still has some space to obstacles. Um, and, uh, well, that, that's not too hard. That can be computed very efficiently. But if you have an environment with more information, like, well, here is just uh, some pavement, and here is a piece of lawn, and suppose uh, the lawn has a bigger cost or higher cost than the pavement. Well, if you now want to compute a shortest path, then uh, that seems to be very difficult. And in fact, uh, you never uh, can create a method or an algorithm that computes an optimal path. Such an algorithm, algorithm will never exist. And that has been proven because it's too complicated. And this is due to uh, some, uh, well, for instance, uh, Fresnel's law with uh, the refraction of light, etc., that is being used. And um, there exist no solutions. However, you can create um, heuristics to uh, create a reasonable short path. So that's fun. Uh, so we, uh, there are methods to create indicative routes. Now we have to traverse them. Uh, so what I said before, we pick points on this route and which we try to follow. And while picking these routes, you can also take the underlying terrain information into account. So here is an, uh, an example where we created multiple character profiles uh, one for a parent and one for a kid. This is a forest-like environment with a forest uh, path. And what happens here is that um, the parent uh, takes a path that uh, where they avoid uh, feet being uh, get wet. Uh, they are attracted to a panoramic viewpoint. They don't want to jump over tree trunks, and well, they end up here. And for a kid, you have different behaviors. Um, so this is a way to traverse uh, these routes. Uh, up to now, I have only been talking about uh, creating individual motions. Uh, what about crowds? Because, well. So um, the question is, what is realistic collision avoidance behavior? So let's look at this example. I think there's no sound now, but... Crowds. 
this is realistic because it has been performed by humans, right? So let's look at another example. Also, this is realistic because humans do it. <laughs> so, what is realistic behavior? Well, the answer is it's way too complicated. We cannot create a model uh, that creates realistic behavior for one person yet. We can create realistic models for a whole crowd because we can think of aggregate data like uh, how people flow, what densities are, etc. I'll come back to that. So how do we create the models? So um, when we talk about collision avoidance, which is like a basic building block for crowds, well, we have at our uh, uh, department a motion capture lab. Um, in such a lab, you attach uh, markers. Those markers are being observed by cameras. Uh, each of those cameras creates a 2D picture, uh, and all of those 2D pictures are combined into a 3D model um, of a human. And this allows us to study motions. So what we did is we did lots of experiments with people. Uh, we placed one person there, one there, and they had to avoid each other. And by doing it uh, at multiple distances with male, female, etc., all kinds of parameters, we, uh, well, we have created a model of collision avoidance. So um, like uh, six years ago, we were really happy with uh, this result because finally we had a model where there were no collisions. So, uh, and you can uh, see maybe, you can maybe observe there are no collisions. We were very happy, but no, not uh, any, obviously. And the reason is, this is not human-like behavior. Because it's way too good, there are no collisions, there is no group behavior, uh, there is no variation in speeds, there is uh, nothing like go with the flow, etc. So, uh, we were happy, but this is not good. So, we have been improving this model. So uh, this is some work done uh, by a student, um, and uh, he looked at uh, creating uh, motions for groups. So groups have to stay coherent. Sometimes they can split up into smaller groups and then uh, merge again. There are all kinds of rules. Uh, for instance, if one person uh, gets behind, then the group uh, will uh, wait, etc. So uh, we looked at lots of literature from sociology, sociology uh, psychology to um, come up with this uh, model. Another kind of research was, uh, well, suppose we have a very dense crowd. How can a certain person make room to, uh, well, basically find uh, its way? Um, another kind of research is uh, we try to, to create a model that works for low-density situations, so where you only have, like, one person per square meter, but also in high-density situations. And here we can uh, play with uh, all kinds of parameters. So this person is really to, uh, inclined to go with the flow, but at a certain moment, uh, the deviation to the road becomes so high that he still is uh, pushing through the crowd. And this is way more believable behavior. And we can set this uh, individual or uh, collective parameter for each of those persons to get more realistic behaviors. And uh, we have shown that uh, it uh, leads to way less bottleneck. So uh, when you simulate crowds, it's very simple to get a bottleneck in a simulation, while in reality there is no bottleneck. So that means that the methods are not good enough. And uh, here we use the state of the art in collision avoidance, and we created, we made an environment such crowded that people just got stuck. And uh, by adding this go with the flow, um, people automatically create lanes. And, uh, well, these lanes is the result of what is called emergent behavior. So behaviors that uh, come into existence while they haven't been programmed. Um, and that's what we want. Um, so the question still is, what is realistic behavior? So let's look at one minute video, <laughs> which might answer it.
be nice to simulate such a thing. And obviously, it's a piece of art with lots of cutting and, and uh, editing uh, clips. But I think it's, it's funny. And it's still, uh, again, it answers the question. It's really difficult to come up with realistic behaviors. Uh, so I uh, discussed a uh, crowd simulation framework that ex uh, is composed of uh, five levels of uh, planning. So uh, we created a software package that can uh, that has integrated all of this research, uh, which we sell to uh, the industry, uh, but it's freely available uh, for research. Um, so um, uh, we can handle like 65,000 65, uh, agents or characters in real time on a very fast computer. Uh, and we can do like one million on one PC, so which is really unique. There is no other software that can do that. Uh, it is used by the industry to uh, create uh, car simulators. Uh, it's uh, uh, used uh, for evacuation studies in uh, train stations. It's used by uh, Homeland Security in the, the States to find out how many casualties there are when a bomb explodes, etc. Um, now we're doing evacuation studies in uh, some metro stations. Uh, study crowd flows in the Apple, so it has many applications. Um, there are many research questions like, uh, well, we create a model, but what is the model based on? Uh, so we have to do way more validations of the model, and that's very complicated. Uh, there are ways to validate the model by uh, creating a camera system that observes the crowd and so that you can compare simulated data with real data. We are now working on that. Also, we would like to simulate a million people on one PC in real time. Uh, and we w would like to predict what will happen in a few minutes. Um, so some messages. Uh, when we want to create a crowd simulation system, uh, you have to uh, really think about how are you going to represent the underlying space, which is really computer science, um, such that computer can do fast computations. Uh, it has to consist of many uh, different levels which you can tweak. Um, we have to think um, uh, about surfaces instead of graphs. Um, and, well, basically we shouldn't compute a path, but uh, corridors, like, uh, well, such that it becomes compatible for crowds. Um, so many people participated here, so um, I'm uh, really happy to work with them. Um, so how much time do we still have? Uh, because I would like to do an experiment with you. Like 10 minutes, okay, so I ne need like five minutes. Um, so another topic which I want to touch a bit is crowd management. So how are you going to do this in practice? Well, um, you have to s uh, interview lots of persons, talk to organizers, talk to uh, governments, etc., to uh, find lots of data. And when you are going to create a, a simulation of a real event, well, that takes a lot of preparation, like three or four weeks to get the simulation ac accurate enough uh, to, well, uh, draw conclusions from. Um, but the question is, well, what, what should we measure of these uh, simulations? Well, for that, it's uh, time for an experiment. So um, I brought one of my tools. So let's see. I've hidden it here. It's a rope. And I, con oh, I construct it in such a way that the uh, surface is exactly one squared meter. Uh, so I have a question for you. How many people will fit in one squared meter? Like this. Uh, so who thinks like uh, three people? So can you raise a hand if you think it's uh, three? Uh, then we have four, uh, one, and then five. No, six, uh, three, uh, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, um, then we have, uh, where are we, five? Uh, six, and then seven, uh, okay, eight. That's uh, okay, like five, uh, nine, that's one, two, ten, one, eleven, twelve, thirteen, uh, twenty, thirty. Okay, um, so I'd like to invite uh, some of you um, to, uh, well, do an experiment. And what I would like is that uh, persons are going to uh, stand inside this uh, uh, area and we are going to gradually fill it up with the crowd. So uh, who wants to participate? It's not very dangerous. Uh, okay, so can you uh, step forward? And I need more people, so uh, I need like uh, 10 people or so. Uh, so now we have one, let's count. And uh, try to uh, stay inside this area. We have two, we have three, and we need more. One, two, three, four, five. We have six. We have seven. And eight, so let's stop for now. 
So, uh, so it's, uh, try to uh, put it like this. It's really uh, convenient. So uh, this is eight people in a squared meter. And um, when uh, the love parade was going on, this density led to all kinds of uh, pressure waves and people got killed. So th in a real crowd, this is dangerous. It's not dangerous if you stand still because this happens uh, when you are uh, uh, near uh, a uh, performer and then you're just watching, it's fine. But once you start moving, you consume lots of more space. So let's do that uh, very carefully. So can you start moving a little bit in this direction? And you see that you have to do like, like this. It is getting more uh, difficult. So let, let's add some people. Now we have eight, so I would like to have uh, two more people. And I've done it with the students with uh, all kinds of ages, so I kind of know the limits and where people die. So, um, <laughs> so uh, now we are eight. Uh, can I invite some more people? Ah, my colleague. Thanks a lot for that. We have nine. It's getting more and more crowded. And could we have one more? And then uh, I won't put uh, in more people. So one more person. It's yeah, maybe. Uh, okay. So uh, let's have ten. Just uh, go inside. And then, uh, well, sorry for that. So um, I'm making a collection of uh, my uh, rope examples. So uh, thanks for that. Now, so uh, I won't po put it on uh, on YouTube, uh, LinkedIn. Uh, so um, try to um, make a few steps very carefully. And you see that it is all getting quite uh, complicated. Uh, okay, uh, thanks a lot. So let's uh, thank them for this um, thing. When it is getting even more crowded, like uh, 12 or 13 persons per square meter, it's really possible. Then uh, the middle person can really uh, lift up uh, their feet and then it is dragged along. And, uh, but uh, having so many people that, uh, that are starting to move is very um, dangerous. And uh, what I said before, it is dangerous because uh, at certain places there are not that many people, but in other places there's really a lot of people. And uh, this results in crowd uh, waves of uh, pressures. And uh, if you are in the peak of such a wave, you simply get crushed. The human body cannot take this. Um, and when you organize an event, and when you do the simulations, you have to find out uh, uh, whether uh, the crowd density is higher than four and a half persons per square meter. That's uh, kind of the thre threshold. If you have more, then it becomes dangerous and you have to take counter measurements, like uh, install uh, fences that break pressure waves, uh, like uh, uh, saying to people you have to walk in that direction, close off certain areas, and this is what happens when you do crowd management. Um, so we did also um, uh, simulations for preparations of the Tour de France, which was the last year here in Utrecht. And uh, the city of Utrecht asked us, is it still safe to organize such an event uh, where we have 350,000 visitors on the busiest day, which was uh, July 4th on a Saturday. And it turned out that uh, near this area, near the uh, Jaarbeurs and uh, the Beatrix building, maybe some people of you know it, uh, it would become way too crowded. And as a result, they moved away some fences, they installed one-way uh, traffic and also pedestrian bridges to release the crowd flow. And this happens. Um, so when uh, you organize such an event, 99% of uh, all the things you do comes by just thinking and maybe 1% or 2% comes by doing simulations. So simulations can help organizers to make it more safe. Um, so if you want to know more about this research, you can uh, contact me. You can also go to uh, well the area, the Utrecht area there. We have a demo and I, I uh, can explain more. Uh, thank you for your attention and I'm happy to uh, answer questions. All right, thank you. Let's give a warm applause. So any questions from the audience? We have one here. Yeah, hi. Um, it's not related to the simulations so much, but to the collision. When you studied how people behave in collisions, did you find an answer why two bikes will inevitably collide if they come from uh, opposite directions? Yeah, that also holds with people. Eh? So if, if, if you have a model then, uh, um, so, so what you have to do to uh, get it right in, in, uh, in practice, uh, you have to add some noise to the directions in which people move. 
Uh, if you don't add noise, then you can have forces that uh, perfectly uh, are opposite, and then you have a situation which cannot be resolved. So that uh, does it answer your question, or is it? Uh, so, so what we saw in the collision avoidance models that people tend to look ahead quite far, especially if they can see a lot, and uh, so they. Um, uh, from a quite early moment on, they start to deviating from their uh, normal direction. So they start to turn the body a little bit, very slightly, or they um, uh, speed down or speed up a little bit. And those are quite subtle movements. However, in real crowds, still things go uh, wrong because communication is wrong, because you have different cultures that interact. And then sometimes uh, something uh, which is called uh, a reciprocal dance occurs, that uh, one person steps to the side and the other one also does the same. So, well, lots of coordination and, uh, well, it, it's actually uh, going on to get it right. And people make mistakes and, well, these models usually don't make mistakes and well, that's not good. So, we are definitely not there yet, uh, but it is a start, I think. Any more questions? Yes. So, uh, does this model, um, no, how is, uh, is a panic situation uh, simulated? Yeah, so panic is a quite interesting uh, thing. Um, so, uh, we are used, most of us are used to Hollywood uh, films, and um, they gave us a complete wrong idea of what panic is, because what panic is is that everybody in the crowd starts uh, fleeing around and uh, starts mo uh, moving like... Uh, uh, zombies, and this is really not what happens. Only when there is an imminent uh, threat of people, like there is uh, now an explosion going off, only in the first uh, few seconds people start doing random stuff, and then uh, they start realizing, well, what I do I have to do, or etc. And um, it, it turns out that at those situations, after maybe 10 seconds, people are really inclined to help each other and to, uh, well, follow the leader or, well, or more coping strategies. Um, so what uh, Hollywood has presented us is uh, actually wrong, um, and uh, well, you have to take all these things into account. Like uh, there is a time when you see something, you have to uh, do something with it in your brain. Some people they just freeze. Some uh, they uh, well start uh, off uh, walking, uh, helping other people. So there are m multiple uh, coping strategies. And when you want to create realistic behaviors, you really have to take into account all kinds of different behaviors with the right. Uh, chance distributions, uh, etc. So uh, it's difficult to get it right. Yeah. Maybe a small question for myself. Have you ever thought about a cooperation with uh, the gaming industry, going the other way around, instead of learning from the gaming, giving something back to the gaming? Yes. So uh, we talk a lot with uh, people from the gaming industry. So uh, uh, I also supervise uh, master students, and uh, a few of them are uh, working with Guerrilla Games, for instance, here in the Netherlands. And uh, so. Uh, but it turns out that all these uh, parties, they use uh, similar models. Uh, uh, I can uh, name them, but uh, like uh, helping social force model, uh, uh, reciprocal velocity obstacles uh, for the people that really know uh, this uh, stuff. So uh, most of those people use uh, those kind of models. But I think uh, we can go uh, farther, uh, way further than uh, that. Uh, yeah. All right. Any more questions from the audience? If not, we have a small gift for you. I would like to ask you one more applause, Dr. Roland Gerard. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you.